Welcome back everyone. We are in Omaha, Nebraska today at the University of Omaha and we are meeting with Dr. Benjamin Alvarado who is going to talk to us about poli-sci and also about uh, the national security work that he's been doing for quite some time and we may even touch a little bit on the American Security Project. So with that, I'll just pass it to you for a little bit of background. How did you get to where you are today? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I, w I, was, uh, I enlisted in the Navy after one year in, in college because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And after the, the stint in the Navy, I got back to California where I'm from and realized that I did want to go into um, looking at some of the things that I ex experienced. Um, uh, it was still the Cold War. We were still at loggerheads with the Russians. I still didn't know and understand um, why we spent so much time in the Mediterranean chasing subs and, and <laughs> Russian battleships. But I think what was interesting about that experience is it really opened my mind to exploring as to why we were doing the things that we were doing, what it was costing us as, as a nation in terms of... Uh, you know, human and, 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 and financial capital. And so I really kind of positioned myself to try to do that and understand it. I kind of stumbled into the world of nuclear nonproliferation as a consequence. And so my initial thought was that I'm going to become a nuclear policy analyst, and I did, um, with, with a longer term dream of maybe going back to work uh, in the intelligence community. And through that, uh, experience um, it gave me an opportunity to begin to work and travel um, in Latin America because I spoke Spanish because I had this unique knowledge set as it related to arms control immediately was um, working in places like Buenos Aires and, and Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo and Santiago de Chile and Mexico City and Havana Cuba of all places and so I ended up doing my doctoral dissertation on Cuba's attempt to develop a nuclear energy capability. Um, and I thought that I was gonna continue on that trajectory and actually was um, very successful for a few number, a number of years back in the 90s, but I stumbled into the classroom and it just really kind of sent me in a whole different direction. So um, I spent about 20 years teaching uh, U.S. foreign policy, national security policy, and intelligence studies, and um, just have recently become an administrator here at the university. But really, that's where I am. That's where I'm from. That's what, what I think you know makes me think during the day. And, and I still have an opportunity now to try to parlay what I know and understand, offer that to incent as an incentive to students who want to perhaps go into a career field like that. So that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so. I've been really helping to prepare young people to pursue careers in the intelligence community and government service. It's the highest calling and it's something I'm very passionate about and fortunately happened to be at a university with its close association from one of our graduates, former secretary Chuck Hagel, to really have a lot of uh, support for that. Our proximity to the strategic command at Offutt Air Force mm -hmm. Base makes that possible. So, you know, like I said, I'm really kind of a saint of circumstances, um, but I'm really taking full advantage of all of that. What makes a student ready for all that you have lived that wants to go into this intelligence community? Well, what, what, what I look, what we look for collectively, because it's not just one person. It, in this instance, it's, it's an entire group of faculty and administrators and support staff that, that try to you know identify young people <clears throat> who have a deep passion for trying to understand the world that they live in, who we know have you know the academic chops to make that become a reality, but also then we start looking at the profile of that individual. You know, um, do they have their feet on the ground? Um, do they know that it's imperative that they keep their nose clean? That they that they not you know. Um, engage in behavior that could be detrimental. You know, the thing that I, I always remind students of is that, you know, in a world where social, um, you know, uh, platform, media platforms, you know, dominate their lives, are they being careful with what they put out into the world? Because guess what? It stays out there forever. 
And so we've been very careful to try to coach young people and then provide them with the structure in terms of the, of, uh, of the curriculum that will prepare them, give them a, a sound understanding of what's out there in the world as far as a challenge is concerned, what skills and competencies that they need to be prepared if that's indeed where they want to go. And then we give them additional opportunities to exercise their knowledge and to network with other young people from across the country. Um, we belong to uh, uh, an alliance of, of about 30 universities across the country that are now kind of specialing and rekindling um, ideas around deterrence and deterrence theory. And we think that that's setting our students apart. So when they do go and apply, that something sticks out that's, that's going to make them uh, uh, more likely than not a, a valued candidate for a position working in the government. So talk to us about deterrence theory. For those who don't know what it is, can you explain Well, yeah, it it's, 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 it's a very formal um, approach to trying to understand the motivations as to why a nation would pursue uh, a weapons of mass destruction capability. And then what instruments, both in terms of policy, with defense postures that the country can put into place to deter that, that initiative, to deter that you know, impetus to go towards that. We understand that you know, pursuing uh, weapons uh, capabilities is perhaps the most costly and technologically advanced pursuit that any nation can do. And knowing full well that you know, it also has a significant downside. So a big part of that is, is being able to posture ourselves to deter them from pursuing that but then also giving them, as, as, as a partner in, in world security, an opportunity to understand you know, where they might lie in that and why it might not be the best thing for their country to pursue that. And, and I think, by and large, um, we have been successful. And yet, the threats remain. Uh, they're, they're very, and they're existential threats. You know, the possibility that if something were to occur, by intent or by accident still has a significant potential impact, uh, negative impact on the world. And we've just seen recently with this uh, mystery explosion in Northern Russia that, uh, you know, it's calling into question the extent to which um, those ideas around nuclear uh, uh, treaties and agreements, um, the types of uh, national, international types of organizations that we have into place to ensure that there isn't the proliferation of, of weapons, technology, personnel, financing. It's a very complex and dense reality, but I think it's imperative now that we, you know, it's the Cold War ended, it did not mean that the threat went away. Absolutely. And I think that that's what the important thing today now to, to carry forward. And so as we start to build up these young people to be ready to take on this philosophy and to enact it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I'm focused on a lot is what I call national readiness and mm -hmm. really saying, how do we ensure that we're ready for the future? And that, that covers a wide swath of areas. It's everything mm -hmm. from healthcare to making sure we still mm -hmm. have an environment. But this is certainly mm -hmm. a major piece of it. Uh, one is, what is it that we need to have in the future? But the second part of that very closely is how do we ensure that we have that pipeline ready? Mm -hmm. And we are definitely struggling mm -hmm. in um, having eligibility for active duty military. Mm -hmm. We are struggling in ensuring that we have cyber defense mm -hmm. individuals that are lethal and being capable at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. And we are short on capabilities of individuals for intelligence community. Mm -hmm. For a variety of things you mentioned. One, we kept your nose clean. That's a basic one. Your feet on the ground. Are you able to handle the emotional toll that some of this will mm -hmm. take? Because you will be exposed to events, concepts, ideas, realities mm -hmm. that not everybody wants to know exists. Mm -hmm. And then it's rigorous. Mm -hmm. It's very, very rigorous. And so <laughs> this, this possibility pot mm -hmm. gets smaller and smaller and smaller all the time. Mm -hmm. You all are, correct me if I'm wrong, a, a center of excellence mm -hmm. in this area. How do you get to be that? And then how does that help build this pipeline up? Mm -hmm. Well, those are, those are competitive endeavors. Uh, to, be, to, to be, you know, granted um, that title of the Center for Academic Excellence, you have to have in place, obviously, uh, people who can teach the curriculum, but also you have to have a curriculum 
that is sound and is going to meet those particular challenges. On top of that, you also have to have um, in place systems of support that will prepare the students to pursue the opportunity should it present itself. You know, I mean, the, the call for people is always out there. It's, not, it's whether or not they can meet muster. Right. And so our job is to ensure that we're preparing the next generation of intelligence, you know, community um, individuals, uh, folks that go to the different uh, IC agencies, but also individuals who want to work on intelligence through um, the D Department of Defense or individuals who want to work as contractors or individuals who have extremely narrow but and specialized skill sets, that cybersecurity mm -hmm. being one of them. And, and just an example of that is that, you know, so we were very astute at training cybersecurity individuals who were very technically, you know, proficient. Mm -hmm. But what we soon discovered is that you needed to have managers as well. Yeah. Individuals who fully understood the technical dimension of it but also had the management skill to be able to kind of corral these individuals because, you know, very often they're, they're unique. Let's just put it that way. And that's, that's, that's not... I can because I have a child and a husband like this. They, that's not a dig at those individuals. No. But what it means is that you have to have individuals who are conversant across different platforms. Yes. And it takes a special type of person. Yes. And, and, and part of our job, I believe, is exposing young people not only to that possibility, but also exposing them to the skills and competencies that they're going to need to be successful. And for me, that's a, that's a great challenge, but I see it as a wonderful opportunity, you know. So what, a lot of what we have done at the university is to coach up not only the students, but my fellow administrators as to why this is important. Like and for us to have a relationship not only with um, uh, the, the Strategic Command here in Omaha, but to have opportunities to work through the Department of Defense with special structures that will bring more money to the university, both the medical center and the university itself, to work on projects that, and I think that's actually gonna be the model moving forward. Yeah. I don't believe that the government needs to reinvent the wheel when you have remarkable world-class universities and, and medical centers where they can conduct the research that's necessary without having to build, you know, more infrastructure inside of Washington, D.C. And we see that, that that's already a trend that people are trying to go down, you know, maybe for the wrong reasons right now, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, the day we'll be able to find an accommodation between both, you know, that we can have academic centers of excellence and research that can definitely serve the interests of the nation. Yeah, a little tidbit for those watching the... Um one of the findings that I, that I had in government was that 60% of our economic development is through these kinds of programs, is through innovation dollars that go out. And I think a lot of folks think about university as you know, a four-year institution or a check in the box or, or, or they think about student loans. And what we're really talking about is preparation of our country for the future. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this, is not, this is not a choice, this is not a check in the box, this is a mandatory event, a mandatory institution, mm -hmm. and really I would say network of institutions mm -hmm. uh, that we have to make sure that we continue to facilitate. But I will absolutely uh, agree with and support your position that this doesn't all need to be hugged in Washington. In fact, it shouldn't be. Um, and we don't need to keep building, building, building. What mm -hmm. we need to do mm -hmm. is exercise and spread out those models that we know are working. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you, you mentioned as we went through this list um, and then we started to hit another. As we go through the list, we were looking almost at characteristics, mm -hmm. tendencies of the person, capability. Mm -hmm. What we didn't talk about, that we started to touch on, were specific skill sets. Mm -hmm. And before we got on camera, we talked about diversity mm -hmm. and the benefits. One of the things that Lieutenant General Severiat of the Air Force mm -hmm. Academy said, diversity is a force multiplier. And of course, what he's trying to say is that as we create these teams, mm -hmm. and we look to the future, these, these problem sets become much more complex. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to have simply those who understand, as you put it, the technical side. We need them to understand other pieces. Mm -hmm. There's a program called FIRST Robotics, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, mm -hmm. where they, it's for young people, mm -hmm. and they battle robots. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's so fascinating about that program, though, is that they have somebody who's in charge of marketing. And they have somebody who's in charge mm -hmm. of cheerleading and somebody who's in charge of design. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that 
is fascinating because we don't always think of those. Well, we've taken a kind of a radical reconfiguration of how we address that, um, not specifically in, in, in as it relates to national defense and national security right now, but we have a cadre of students here at the university who are in a very special program who've come here to study uh, information technologies, computer science, engineering, and traditionally it's just been kind of, they've got a really good scholarship, but I think the donors were very interested as to whether or not we were actually doing something that was transformative in their lives. And so we've kind of re rejiggered the program all, uh, completely to now what we we're doing is we're introducing significant elements of what constitutes leadership, what constitutes um, new thinking as it relates to problems, uh, and so that they're not just problem solvers, but solution providers, right. which is a whole flip on it. Yeah. And so what we're doing is we're exposing our students to and take them to the Stanford School of Design, and they're, they're, they're learning design thinking. Um, and we did this, an experiment this summer where we had a group of our students work with folks from Apple to develop unique apps. Now, that's just scratching the surface. Right. But I would venture to say after four years of being in a program like that, where they're continuously being challenged with how do you, how do you become a solution provider, how do you become a transformative leader in American society, that that's what I think universities are going to have to become yes. in the future. I don't think they can be the static types of institutions where you just have this discipline and you're going to go into this job field. I think that uh, we sold our, we've sold ourselves short, we sold society short yeah. because that we have not infused these ideas into them. If something has worked doesn't mean, because something works doesn't mean that it's working as well as it can. Yeah. So how do we, and so we've gone to the point where we have changed the narrative at the university to say, this is a great program, yes, and what more can we be doing to ensure that what we're putting into society is really going to help society meet the very complex challenges that we have before us. Everything can be seen as a challenge and an opportunity. And so we call these design challenges, you know? So how do we redo this? Because it's, it's okay, work, it's worked okay in the past, but you know, society is now demanding of us and and if we're going to be attentive to our taxpayers yes. we have to meet that challenge <laughs> and to, to segue that because that builds right nicely into this american security project that you've talked about tell us a little bit about exactly that point with regard to this that holistic thinking that design thinking beyond just the narrow security, but the support of it. Well, um, so the university is fortunate that one of its graduates is former Senator and Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. And um, he's always been a, a very ardent proponent and advocate of public service. And I think that, um, you know, he was the first enlisted man to serve as, as Secretary of Defense. I did not case. know that. That yes. is a fantastic point. It is a phenomenal yes. point. Yes. And so he's really enabled our institution to take great, great pride in that. And so obviously once you've been a U.S. Senator who, who spent a lot of time working on defense and national security issues and subsequently serving as the Secretary of Defense of the United States, that he has a very unique position on how he sees the world and how he sees American society relative to the, the defense structure in the United States. And so initially he was part of one think tank, but I think what he decided to do was to partner with other um, former legislators and former uh, Department of Defense officials to create a think tank, so to speak, that would focus on the intersection of a lot of the ideas that aren't strictly the domain of defense policy, but things that really have an influence on defense policy. So, you know, of looking at issues related to climate change, mm -hmm. of looking at issues related to energy, you know, in the world today, of, of looking at some of the, you know, the elements of, of our um, technology platforms and the cybersecurity issue as that's all come to the fore and really become a lot more pronounced and actually, you know, is, is, is a credible national security threat in a manner that it wasn't just oh, yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah, and, 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 and so we need to know and to understand that. And so our best universities in this country today are working on those particular issues. But I think to have a counterpart in Washington, D.C. that brings individuals like myself in and, you know, 
I don't regularly work there, but I, I do go in and, and I participate in seminars and workshops there. And I'm actually participating in a book launch next week on a, on a new kind of looking at U.S. policy toward Cuba. Um, Cuba's small change in, in, in the larger kind of panorama of U.S. foreign policy issues. But I think the fact that we're still talking about it 60 years after the Cuban Revolution oh, yes. means that we really haven't made the kind of progress that we should be making. So for me, it's, it's a joy to be a part of an organization like that. I've, this is my third or fourth you know, association with, with a Beltway Bandit, so to speak. <laughs> it's like that term. But, but, but what I like about it for me is that it, it, it keeps me on my toes. I mean, I know that when I go to D.C., I need to be prepared and be on my best, you know, in terms of what I have to offer to yeah. others. And so I, it's a great way to interact um, as, as, a, as, a, you know, as a national security policy analyst and as a, as a university educator. That for me, this is a great opportunity. But what you know, is great about it for me is that I also get to see a number of my former students there in Washington, D.C. And you get to meet new folks as well. Wow. You have hit the pipeline all the way through, mm -hmm. right? From identification to how it is that you educate them, to how it is that you get them connected, and then see them off on their way, and also now they're your colleagues. Well, that's exactly it, <laughs> right. you know. I'm, and so, the, you know, I've been at this game long enough now that when I go to New York or to Washington or to Los Angeles, it's very easy for me to pick up the phone and say, "Why don't you invite a couple of the friends and let's get together and have 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 dinner." And we can have a really, really robust conversation about things that are important in the world. And that I, I, I get no better, you know, satisfaction out of things than being able to do that. I love it. I love it. And thank you for giving us a lot of hope and faith that people are working on these kinds of problems. I think so much uh, discussion right now, and certainly through my travels, people are feeling nervous. They're feeling uneasy. They're wondering. Who are the people that are working and, and looking at these things? And so when we hear from someone like you, mm -hmm. it's so solid. And it's so clear how much is happening mm -hmm. and the robust discussions that are occurring. Mm -hmm. That feels good. Mm -hmm. That feels really good. And, and um, thank you. Thank you for your service. Because well, that's what it is, isn't it? It is. Um, that's the way that I'm wired. Um, and I just am always looking for new opportunities to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today.